We gather together to worship on the land of the Wurundjeri people. As we gather, we acknowledge the wattle and the cockatoo, and this bend in the Burring River was taken without consent or negotiation. We give our respects to the elders past, present and, and emerging. We pledge ourselves to work alongside these first people to achieve a just future for all. That was Oliver doing our acknowledgement of country today. Thank you so much, Oliver. That was gorgeous. Welcome everybody to worship in this moment, in your lives, in this space and in the space of your hearts. Mary Oliver once wrote, pay attention. Then patch a few words together and don't, don't try and make them elaborate. This isn't a contest, but a doorway into thanks and into a silence in which another voice may speak. So let's pay attention together during this we space, in this moment, to the movement of spirit, to an ancient story of a boy and his father on the mountainside of their lives, and to being seen by each other and by our God. Let's worship. In your joy I will remain 
Our reading today is given to us by the lovely Arthur. Now, many of you probably don't know this, but Arthur used to be a minister. And for years, I've been trying to get him up into this pulpit to share with us a story, but he always refuses to. But I did, in this COVID time, manage to get him on camera doing the reading. Thanks, Arthur. Our reading today comes from Genesis chapter 2, reading from the first verse. After these events, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, Abraham answered, I'm here. God said, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah. Offer him up as a burnt sacrifice there on one of the mountains that I will show you. Abraham got up early in the morning harnessed his donkeys, donkey and took two of his young men with him together with his son Isaac. He split the wood for the burnt offering, set out and went to the place that God had described to him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place at a distance. Abraham said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will walk up there worship, and then come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. He took the fire and the knife in his hand, and the two of them walked together. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, My father, Abraham said, I'm here, my son. Isaac said, Here is the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the offering? Abraham said, The lamb for the burnt offering? God will see to it, my son. The two of them walked on together. They arrived at the place where God had described to him. Abraham built an, an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He tied up his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. But the Lord's messenger called out to Abraham from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Abraham said, I'm here. The messenger said, don't stretch out your hand against the young man and don't do anything to him. I now know that you revere God and didn't hold back your son, your only son, from me. Abraham looked up and saw a single ram caught by its horns in the dent underbrush. Abraham went over, took the, the ram and offered it as a burnt offering instead of his son. Abraham named the place, the Lord sees. That is the reason that people today say, on this mountain, the Lord is seen. This is the word of the Lord. So in the story today, um, the way the story goes, God asks someone to do something which is not really very good. In fact, it's really bad. And the person, Abraham, who's a very old man at this stage, he says, yes. So I was thinking about all those times in our lives where someone maybe whom we admire or maybe who we think is really cool, like, you know, some kids at school or a big sister or something tells us to do something and we kind of know that we shouldn't, but then we do it anyway because, you know, well, we were asked to. Let's watch. Sometimes we don't mean to be naughty. But then maybe an idea pops into our head and we don't even know where it came from. Sometimes the idea comes from people around us. They might say, hey, you should try doing this or what about doing that? And you know you're not meant to. You know that possibly this could end in tears, but it seems like such an exciting idea. So you do it anyway. Mm -hmm. 
Sometimes you might get other people involved in your naughty idea. Because it's always fun to do naughty things with a friend. And then it happens. The thing that you knew in your back of your mind maybe might happen. The reason your mum told you not to do it in the first place, not to muck around in the church. Sometimes people who are older than us or maybe cooler than us, you know, like a big sister, might encourage us to do things which we know we're not meant to do. But because we want to impress them or because we want to be part of the cool big sister gang, we do it anyway. And at first, it's super exciting. But again, we knew in our heart of hearts that this was not a good idea. We knew that we'd been told over and over again, don't play with fire. Sometimes we might just get that spirit inside us that says, go on, muck things up a bit. Be a little wild, see what happens. And so we do. We create chaos. And there's something liberating about it and there's something fantastic and free. But then of course, people get hurt. People get angry. People get disappointed. And then we feel ashamed and confused and we don't know why we did it in the first place and all we want is to be held in a big warm hug and to be forgiven. And I remember looking at the sky. It was so blue. And I remember thinking, what a terrible thing it is to fall into the hands of the living God. I remember it as if it were yesterday. The sweat on my brow and on his, the weight of the wood and his skin so smooth, and his breath a cloud against the bright blue sky, so very blue. I remember looking at that sky, and I was cursing God inside. I was cursing this God who sent me climbing up, up, up to burn my boy on the mountainside. <laughs> and for what? For his pride for his proof for his despotic dark heart but I, I pushed it down it's blasphemy <laughs> mine is not to reason why thy will not mine be done and it's all part of a plan and all that Put your trust in the Lord, they say. I mean you're too small to comprehend the great mystery and all that. Maybe it's a punishment for not living as a righteous one. Or maybe... But his breath against the bright blue sky and his smile and his eyes looking up at me. My boy. My beautiful. Bonny boy. And I do not understand what I do, said St. Paul, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do, said Abraham, as he walked up the mountainside with his son, sweet Jesus. We all make choices every day big and small, that impact and ripple across the rest of our lives. My foster daughter, who is of Nepalese descent, 
just recently was asked by a stranger in a shopping strip mall to sign a Black Lives Matter petition. And she did. It seemed like a small choice as a young woman of colour, a simple choice to make, but for her friend, who was standing next to her, who is also a young woman of colour from migrant background, it was not such a simple choice. For she had been asked by her parents to keep out of trouble, to not get involved, to stay away from protest, to keep her head down. A quiet life, people say. We just want a quiet life. Abraham wanted to live a quiet life, and yet God seemed to keep challenging him to change the course of how he and his people lived. Take off your shoes, said God to Abraham. Believe in me, says God to Abraham. Wander in the desert says God to Abraham, be released from slavery, says God to Abraham, enslave others, says God to Abraham. Now let that slave, let Hagar be abused, says God to Abraham. Now murder your son to prove how much you love me, says God to Abraham. Or so the story goes. And Abraham says, Yes. And while we know that the murder did not happen, we also know from the story, as theologian Frederick Beekner puts it, we also know that from that day forward, Abraham had a strange habit of breaking into tears at odd moments. And his relationship with his son was never close. And Sarah, we don't know if she could ever forgive him. Choices. Sign the petition, don't sign the petition. Join the protest or not eat meat or don't eat meat. Pick up the phone and take your money out of the bank that supports fossil fuels or don't. Uh, love your neighbour or don't. Wash your hands continuously to protect your neighbour or don't. Pull down a statue or don't. Rename a mountain or don't. We all make choices. And in today's story, Abraham is asked to make what seems like an impossible choice. To obey the God whom he loves by sacrificing his son, whom he loves and Abraham thinks, and theologians for centuries have tried to make us think, that Abraham has made the right choice by choosing sacrifice. But I, along with yeah, admittedly a very small group of other theologians, um, we don't actually think that this is true and that maybe there was another choice that God desperately, desperately wanted Abraham to make. Because maybe God wanted Abraham to grow up. And part of growing up is moving away from the blind obedience of doing what we are told to do. By culture, by parents, by deities, and by doing instead what is right. Theologian James McGrath asks the question, what would it be like if instead of saying yes, to murder, Abraham instead turned around and said, ah, uh, no, <laughs> no, I won't. And you know what? No God worth worship would even ask such a thing. And how ridiculously insecure are you anyway that you keep needing me to prove my love? And, and why on earth do you need me to prove it through violence? What are you, a teenage gang leader? And then, maybe, then maybe God would have turned around and said, well done, Abraham. Well done. 
I was just testing you and you, you have chosen the good. Abraham could be called, has been called, a fundamentalist, as in a man who will do anything and everything for the God in whom he believes. In our postmodern age, the religious fundamentalist is understood as being one who believes that God is encouraging, commanding and justifying their own vision of the way the world should be. And the name of God sometimes changes, Allah, Kali, Yahweh, Lord, Jesus Christ. But the root of this shadow remains the same. Within the world of psychological study, there is a concept known as witnessed significance. The basic bones of this idea is that the undeveloped ego is constantly seeking to be seen by others in order to be reassured that it actually exists. And the ultimate reassuring eye is, of course, the eye of the parent. But as we mature, it becomes the eyes of our friends or our colleagues or even our God. As spiritual writer Tom Gillette reflects, one of the greatest fears of human existence is that we are invisible, that our lives don't matter. We spend most of our lives struggling with tiny details and the thought that perhaps this entire struggle is utterly meaningless is buried at a deep soul level inside us all. What a piece of work is a man. How noble in reason, how infinite in faculty and form and moving, how express, you know. Hamlet and many others have struggled with this for a very long time. The thought that perhaps this entire struggle is ultimately meaningless, this is something we all struggle with. Being relevant to those we love, to our community, to our culture and our world is perhaps one of the most powerful drives in the human condition. We all want to be included. We all want to matter. We all want to be part of the whole. This time of lockdown and pandemic has for many been particularly challenging around this idea of being seen and seeing the other and of relevance or not. I mean, if I can't leave the house or I can't see my grandchildren or if I've lost my job or if I, I can't sing or I can't teach or I can't preach, then who am I? What am I? What am I without my actions and my achievements? This primal need to be seen is a recognisable developmental state within early childhood. Look, look at me, Mama. Mama, over here. Look at me. You weren't watching. You didn't see. I'm me. No, no, no. Watch me. But sometimes for individuals and for communities, this growing up, for all sorts of reasons, it never takes place. And so we have September 11, and we have the Christian Crusades, and we have a father climbing a mountain to burn his boy. When you hear the story of Abraham, who does your heart beat with empathy and sorrow? Is it for Abraham, the sweating father? Is it for Isaac, the innocent boy? Is it for the ram that just randomly gets sacrificed at the end of the story? Is it for Isaac's mother, silent, unmentioned? Oh, the horror. Is it for God, maybe? who has had this story told about her so full of blasphemy that many will turn away in despair? Or does your heart beat for yourself? For an impossible situation that you might be finding yourself in? A decision to be made, a choice on the mountainside of your life? This week, I took my father by the hand and I led him up the mountainside into respite for a few weeks. And he looked at me with his mind so lost 
And he said, where are we going? And I thought of Abraham leading his son. The sky so blue and his breath, his smile. Ah, my son, my son, but that I would have died for you. My son, my son, my son. We all agree that the story tells us that God was testing Abraham. But some of us, small number of us, actually believe that Abraham failed that test. He didn't stand up and he didn't say no. But that's okay. We and those we love, we all fail all the time, sometimes in ways big, sometimes in ways small. Can we, though, can we, after the failure, can we then do what God does for Abraham? Can we forgive him his trespasses? Can we hold him in our arms? And can we, with unimaginable grace, restore him and set him free? upon the word put it on your son lay the lamb there is none Thank you so much, Paul, all the way up in the countryside, in the blue sky and crisp mornings for sharing with us that song. Our prayers today come to us from the beautiful Jill. I'm not sure if she filmed these in the country or in the city, but she has filmed them for us and we open our hearts now to join with Jill in prayer. Greetings, good people. Greetings from Painesville the land of the Gunai Kurnai people. I give thanks for them and the ways in which they lived sustainably and for the way they cared for and were nurtured by this beautiful part of God's creation. Let us pray together. I invite you just to pause 
and to be still. Just be. Holy God, God of Abraham and Isaac, God of mountains and sacrifices and promises, God of story, God of history, God of love, empower us to be your hands and your feet, to love and to heal and to bring about your kingdom here on earth. Let's pray for our world. Pray for those in positions of power, that they'll listen to those who have wisdom and knowledge at this time and help them to respond with compassion and with generosity. May the voices of justice and reason and love be stronger than the voices of ignorance and greed. And we continue to send our love to all who are suffering for those who have COVID, for those who care for them. We particularly pray for some of the Hagar team in Afghanistan. And we pray for all who are grieving, for all who feel scared, vulnerable, powerless, anxious. We think of those seeking asylum, and we think of the people and the places that are still recovering from our bushfires. God, bring healing and hope. And we pray for our church community that we can continue to be a community of justice, of your love in action. Help us to keep loving one another, to keep calling and caring and doing the work of angels and I invite you now just to pause and spend a moment thinking and praying for those you care deeply about who are you worried about let's open our hearts God as we pay attention to the world around us Help us also to pay attention to you. Make us your children and help us to reflect your presence this day and all days. Amen. The blessing today comes from an ancient prayer and I give it to you now. Um, today's reflection was all about doing the good, doing what is right. And I feel that this blessing captures the essence of this in a really simple few words. Go forth into the world. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the afflicted and show love to everyone. Love and serve our God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of our loving God, the Mother, the Child and the Holy Ghost be among you and within you this day and always. Amen. <laughs>